So without further ado, let's get going. And a very warm welcome to our 138th Security Thought Leadership webinar. And uh, the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today uh, what's going on in the security world so that we have a better type of security tomorrow. And don't forget that our objective is not to try and solve the world's problems today. You can't do that in 45 minutes. It's to inspire thinking, give you ideas, uh, debate what the key issues are and how we might interpret them. And today's a special webinar, not just uh, because uh, it's about the Benelux, but because afterwards we present the Benelux Ospers, who are the outstanding performers in the Benelux uh, uh, area. And uh, we'll be looking at these categories. There were some very, very, very competitive categories, some outstanding winners. So to find out more, please stay with us after the webinar and we will be joined by various judges and various others who will be announcing the winners. First of all, Mofo, let's get back to today's topic, security in the Benelux. What are the barriers to progress and how can they be overcome? And what we're going to be looking at today is looking at the Benelux because it's often uh, presented as an area where they know a bit about security. So what can we learn from this part of the world that can inform how we do it better elsewhere? I have three panelists. And uh, first of all, I will be inviting them to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I'll be inviting each of them to make their opening statement. So once again, let's go and meet our panelists for the 138th time. Uh, first of all, starting off with Philip. Philip, please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Professor. Thank you uh, for having me on this special occasion. Uh, my name is Philippe Smith. I'm working now 12 years in a guarding company, now for Sirius Belgium, where I've been active in, at the operational level and now uh, leading the training uh, institution. Ah, very, very good. Thank you very much indeed, Philippe. And uh, over to Nelly. Hello. So uh, my name is Nela Ekens. I am a criminologist and I already work about 20 years in various roles in the private security business. And currently I work as a corporate security manager at Umicor, um, and I'm also the chapter chair of the Benelux chapter of ACES International. Thank you very much indeed. And finally to Peter. Peter, please introduce yourself. Yes, good afternoon, Martin, and thank you for the invitation for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Peter Lelou. Um, I'm a researcher at the Department of Criminology at Ghent University in Belgium. And the principal focus of my work has been on uh, historical and long-term patterns of private security provision and changing relationships between state and private security actors in Belgium. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Um, um, so what we're going to do then is we're now going to invite each of our panelists to make an opening statement. Uh, while they do, you may want to consider getting your a question in using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Now, um, clearly this is about the Benelux. We've already got a question in from uh, uh, Matthew over in the United States. There are people on this webinar from as far as Asia, Canada, uh, uh, um, and Africa. So uh, don't be inhibited from asking a question. Uh, use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And of course, there's the chat if you want to chat to one another while our panelists are speaking. Without further ado then, let's go back to Philip. And Philip, your opening statement, please. Yes, well, uh, Professor, I think, uh... For me, there are three key strategic weaknesses which I want to uh, mention. First of all, as we all know, in Belgium, we have a very comprehensive set of regulations. And this has led for sure to the professionalism and high quality standards of security professionals nowadays. However, this also leads to structural problems. So if you look to the market structure, we can see that the devil is in the tail. Small firms sometimes screw the rules. Little firms trying to survive take on their battles with the other companies by raising too low prices on the market. We have to be aware for that, that we don't get involved in a race to the bottom. And a long term is bad for clients and the sector in uh, general. At the same time, we see that during crises, crises of all kinds, we see that on the demand side, many unaware customers who in their need for a quick solution fall back on non-regulated security firms or sometimes so-called voluntary uh, organization. For example, during the pandemic, for example, many retail organizations relied on steward companies while actually doing security tasks. And the third point is that the turnover stays too high. 
that has multiple reasons for which many has nothing to do with the work we do or the company they work for, but we have to keep focus on, on occupational safety and well-being of our security officers. Therefore, I'm a great supporter of more leadership skills, soft skills for first-line supervisors for the security teams, and of course, uh, more regulated protection for when security guards get uh, violated. Fantastic, Philip, thank you very much indeed. Some interesting thoughts, plenty of us to come back on to. Um, uh, we do seem to see uh, uh, your part of the world is good at regulation and that has cropped up quite a bit. So I'm sure we'll come back to that. Nile, let's go to you and your opening statement, please. Yes, thank you, Martin. I actually have two points I want to address when we talk about the quality of our security professionals. Um, I think the first one will not be a surprise for you. Um, we, we surely have to keep on working on the qualitative uh, security management training. Um, but I think it's really important that we focus, that it's accessible for the youngsters, people that want to make career change, but also people that are already in the security business today and that want to evolve in their role. Luckily, of course, we have the certification programs that fill that gap, but um, somehow I have uh, the impression that still today inside the, um, the Benelux, these certifications are not always as much valued as they, are, they, they deserve. Um, and then the second point, it's probably a long shot, but I think it will be definitely in the long run, uh, very beneficial uh, for us as security professionals, because many of us are, are doing a great job. But I was wondering, why is it that in a lot of businesses, security remains an unknown topic? And according to me, it is because our profession is not known to the vast majority of our stakeholders. I'm talking about HR, legal, uh, health and safety, facilities, finance, and therefore I really plead that security gets the place it deserves, but by giving it like a basic security module in any of these trainings. And I think it would increase enormously the visibility of our profession and what it would mean to all of these stakeholders, and it will definitely also attract qualitative individuals inside our network. So in the long run, I think the second one is definitely key. Hey, thank you very much indeed. Uh, interesting point and uh, definitely something we'll come back to. Just to say to the audience, don't forget, you can get in your question at using the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Don't forget to get your questions in early and we'll endeavour to incorporate it into the ensuing discussion. Uh, let's go then to our third panellist and get a few thoughts from Peter about this topic. Peter, your thoughts, please. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, today's topic of, of the webinar is how certain barriers can be overcome to progress to a better security industry, um, which I understand as better for the private security sector, but of course also for its clients, uh, its state and non-state partners, the wider public and security in general. Uh, and therefore, I would like to focus on three elements which seem crucial to me from a certain maybe outsider perspective, because given the fact that I'm not a representative of the industry itself, but I have done some research on private security in recent years. Um, and of course, others, other elements can be identifi identified as well, uh, but I will just stick to three important and interlinked ways, which I think are needed uh, to achieve a better operating industry. Uh, first, there should be a clear legislative framework that explicitly includes um, and, and recognizes the existing um, security actors yeah, and the variety and the range among them. Yeah. Too often, the private security industry is defined as one group. And we all know, however, that it contains a wide range of industry, larger and small businesses and companies, um, all of which are involved in security provision. Yeah. But as research has shown, yeah, um, these different segments of what was often seen as one industry, uh, differs from each other in terms of, of, of activities, structures, daily operations, um, authorities, and so on. Um, and I believe that if some segments of the security industry are regulated or strictly, strictly regulated, uh, while others aren't, um, that an industry can emerge that evolves and professionalizes at different speeds. Uh, and this should be avoided. A second statement here is that, and this partly follows from the first, is that there should be given attention to aligning several vital aspects of private security, such as the training of personnel and the management, uh, norms and standards within the sector, and so on. 
And this could lead to a further professionalization of the industry and growing levels of trust towards the private sector in general, both from the government, from the police, from the public. Eh? And this should also be the case for other non-state uh, security provider, providers, which aren't necessarily part of the security industry. I refer to volunteers, stewards, other groups, um, which are sometimes actively involved in, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic and policing certain aspects of that pandemic, uh, and which have taken over some tasks which trained security officers would have been able to manage themselves. Um, and finally, I think that policies and regulations on private security are not enough, but are not efficient if there's no effective monitoring of compliance with these regulatory frameworks. Yeah? And this is important in order to avoid excesses within the industry. Um, although the current legislation in Belgium perceives the security industry as trustworthy and a professional partner in security, eh? uh, I think there might be room for more improvements in the policies regarding control and sanctioning of security companies that comply less with these laws. Um, and the combination of these three um, endeavors or, or requi requirements uh, can avoid the situation where some segments of the industry that do not meet the required standards or regulations um, also put those that do uh, into a negative light. And together, these three elements are important to guarantee a private security industry, which works in line with principles of accountability, legitimacy, public trust, and so on. And this can contribute to a better security industry and providing better uh, security in general. And that concludes my statement. Ben, thank you very much indeed. And uh, um, um, some great observations there. Um, let's begin to tackle these. And we've already got two questions in, ironically, one from the United States and one from Canada. Um, but do use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen and we'll endeavour to incorporate it. So get your questions in early. Let's go to Canada first. And um, I'm going to go to you, Philippe. And uh, Dr. Glenn Kidderingham, a, a former panellist uh, um, on these thought leadership webinars, asked something that I think is very relevant to uh, what you were saying. What prevents, what barriers are in place that are preventing an increase in legislative training, improved training? In other words... It seems quite logical that we should get some legislation behind the requirement to train it. It sounds obvious. What's the barrier to doing that? Nelly, I'll come to you afterwards if I might. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Of course, everything, everyone I think is, uh, is uh, pro uh, mandatory training, but it depends on how it is put in place. Uh, in Belgium, uh, we have a very comprehensive set of rules about how to set up a training institution, uh, which courses have to be uh, given, uh, which uh, uh, people can uh, give these courses, the teachers, um, how many hours for each course, uh, what are the titles for these courses, uh, how do we make the certification and uh, all that. So that is uh, it's one good thing, but uh, we lack um, a more broad vision uh, on which training are needed. Uh, for example, in Belgium, we have a mandatory training for uh, security managers, which is very good, uh, but the focus is on, le on the legislation, which is also very good because we have a very broad range uh, of rules. But then we also have a lot of courses which go about ethics, that's very good, and about uh, risk analysis and so further. But we have no course which helps the security managers, for example, like Neil said, to put security in place in their company, to sell security to the other departments. To, um, to uh, improve the soft skills that these people have, to manage a team, to manage a company. These are, I think, uh, skills that are not uh, given by our training institutions at this moment because we have a big focus on the mandatory uh, trainings uh, at this time. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Nina, do you agree with that? I mean, uh, what's your take on this? Yes, um, actually, everything that is regulated, as uh, Philip mentions, it's it's uh, really put in a in a in a framework that is really very strict. Um, but everything that comes um, on top of that, the real security management, that is something that we that we lack in a way, and what we also are. Like I mentioned, the certifications that we have, they are definitely present. But of course, if I refer to the ACE certification, it's um, 
it's not that the Belgian um, authority or a Dutch authority is going to say, okay, if you have an American-based certification, um, this is good for us, because it's in another language. It's not in Dutch, in French or in German. Those are, of course, the, the official languages in Belgium. So it's really difficult to sell this to, um, to the authorities, even though the certifications or other um, trainings are really good. So um, that makes it difficult to have really this... Um, this, um, how, how can I say it, the authorities to actually really say, okay, this is, this is a good training. No, it seems that then a whole new training needs to be elaborated and it's then not on security management, it's more specific on guarding, for instance, um, or, or, or private detectives or, or really specific uh, things in the security profession, which are, these are also very important, of course, but this really security management like security inside a company, what, what I'm doing day in, day out, this is not something that you can just take off the shelf um, uh, easily. So this is, this is something that we, well, we can still work on. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, Peter, in your opening statement, you did mention aligning uh, the security into training with standards and uh, it'll help professionalism, you were arguing. Um, when I heard you say that, I thought, good point. What's the reason why that isn't happening? Well, uh, from my perspective, I believe that training can be a key element to increase the everyday um, practical operations of security of, uh, personnel as frontline workers. Eh? And also um, to increase them being viewed as professional. Eh? And although, although I'm convinced that uh, the training of security officers has increased a lot, uh, and the, the training requirements has it, have increased a lot uh, the last the past few decades. Um, there probably is still some room for improvements. Huh? Um, training can be important, of course, as to guarantee delivering quality, huh? for, but also for sustainable uh, employment, for example. I, I guess Philippe already referred to it, uh, and Ornele in her, her um, statement. Um, it can upgrade the profession and how it is perceived, uh, certainly when placed in relation to the selection and the training of public police officers in Belgium, for example. Um, and too often, I guess, security officers are still seen as um, those who weren't selected to become a police officer. Um, on the other hand, uh, this, this might also be a concern that the security industry provides job opportunities for groups within society which not always find work very easily. Um, and if the training of security agents become more difficult, more rigorous, um, to decrease differences with the public police, for example, um, to achieve more policing powers, um, we should ask the question, of course, that how can this be reconciled with attracting those maybe disadvantaged groups within society that could become now more easily uh, security officers? Eh? And the risk exists that they will be less motivated for more demanding training courses. Um, also in the case of in-house security services, for example, growing demands uh, and the cost of the growing cost of the training can be more difficult to maintain than for a private security company. Um, that said, I do believe that an increased, um, I, I don't want to further academize the training of security officers, but I do believe that increasing the quality of the training uh, and the program can offer some um, incentives for further professionalization. It can offer additional career perspectives, decrease the high turnover to which Philip, uh, to which Philip mentioned um, or, or referred to in his statement uh, and so on. Um, and this is also something that has that is often forgotten the debate re regarding uh, training. Um, I guess this is also needed for the management, not just for the security officers who work at the front line, but also towards the management, there can be improvements in their training. Eh? Mistakes at higher levels will not always be eh, more will not always be made deliberately. Eh? Yet training in deontology, uh, people's management, leadership skills eh, can be certainly useful as well. I guess for more the management levels. Okay, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm sure we're going to pick up on that in rather different ways. Let me move on because I want to try and incorporate more questions, Philip. Question here from uh, Matthew Porcelli, who's from the United States, former panelist, in fact. Uh, and um, this point about how we get respect for the frontline worker. And I suppose uh, I'd be interested to ask you then, Nelly, a, a general question about how we do it. 
But very specifically, is this ever really possible unless clients pay more? I mean, bottom line, when you consider what it's going to take, is this primarily about clients being prepared to pay more, the price for a good uh, security officer, or is it about more than that? So first of all, Philippe. Yes, well, um, well, I think that, that we all have to uh, admit that uh, if uh, too low prices, uh, of course, every client search for a reasonable price in the market, uh, and, uh, but uh, I think that customers have to be aware that uh, for quality, there is a cost uh, and that you pay for quality. And it's not only the security guard, uh, because if that would be the case, then the only thing that um, th is different from other companies is the uniform. It is the back office, it's the material, it's the communication, it is the hierarchy uh, above the, um, the, uh, the security guard, it is the, the, the quickness, the, the helping customers to find solutions for the problems which uh, are um, which are cross-border than, than guarding or technology and so on. So I think that's something that uh, depends on what the customer uh, is searching. So I don't believe that paying more will give a better security guard, but paying more will give a, a broader package and will give uh, more quality to the customer who will then not uh, be on his own for searching uh, solutions. Um, that is one thing. A uh, second thing is from, uh, okay, that's what the customer pays to the guarding company. That's something different, which is the paycheck of the security guard. Uh, because in Belgium, these are minimum wages. These are fixed. Every security company pays, for, uh, pays uh, the same paycheck for the security guard. So uh, it all depends on the tasks that is um, discussed with the client. Uh, we have different levels. For example, we have SB, SQ, SB is security, aesthetic, basic, and SQ is for quality. That means that the, the tasks which are demanded by the client are more profound. And this means that the uh, security guard is paid uh, more. Okay, interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Nile, let's come to you. I mean, uh, there is this sense, isn't there, that around the world, and this has cropped up on many of our webinars, we need to get a different sort of thinking about the frontline worker in particular, because it's the visible sign by which people see security. And yet, it's difficult to imagine, some people argue, if clients don't pay more, it just isn't going to happen. What do you say? Money is definitely an important factor, uh, Martin. Uh, the thing is that your uh, frontline worker will only be able to deliver qualitative work if on the client side, there is a good follow-up. And whenever the frontline worker is delivering a report uh, about an incident or, or, um, or something that happens, and there is no feedback, there is no follow-up from the customer, the clients, in my instance, for instance, the, the security manager on, on the spot or the local security person, then your quality will never go up. It will go stay the same or go uh, down the drain. It's for me actually a partnership. It's only when both are working towards the same goal that you will get a good uh, responsibility um, uh, and accountability. I, I cannot really use the word accountability for the frontline worker, but what I'm saying is the person that will be at, your, uh, at the door, he will feel really responsible for the tasks that he is performing because he knows that the customer in the back will be there whenever it's necessary. And I think that's the key role. Security guards, are, our front line is so important um, in many aspects. And as a customer, you need to uh, acknowledge that and make time to, to uh, build that quality. And yes, money is important. Uh, I have uh, an example like that in Poland, for instance. We we wanted to really increase uh, the money, I mean, the paycheck uh, of our security guards, but it wasn't allowed by um, uh, the law at that time. So it was really important. Uh, it was really difficult to find the right people. But once we were able to give uh, another um, incentive, then it went better and we got the right people. So it is definitely something that goes hand in hand. So I think this is really important. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I mean, it's slightly positive not to think about this just in financial terms, um, uh, if we can. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, um, let me come to you, Peter, if I might. 
And I want to pick you up on one of the first things you spoke about uh, in terms of regulation. And uh, Danielle Dijon has asked about the different legislative regimes in different countries, in the Benelux to start with, but indeed around Europe. And I wonder whether, Peter, that um, therein rests our problem, that uh, if you have different regulatory regimes and you have different lowest standards and you have, as, as has already been said, you get regimes with a different amount of bite and force, then uh, there's a danger the lowest common denominator becomes the reference point. To what extent uh, can we uh, look to legislation to help us solve this via regulation? Um, that's indeed a good point, Martin, and a good question. Um, I, I believe that it's not only at um, an EU, EU level, at the level of the European Union, for example, where different legislations exist, but also if you take a look at Belgium, for example, and how the private security industry in Belgium is regulated, um, you could see that there are also some weaknesses within this regulation, and that it's not, it's not always up to date. Eh? For example, um, a couple of years ago in 2017, the most visible part of the private security industry received this new re regulation with the law of 2 October of uh, two, 2017 on private security. Um, however, this has not been the case for private detectives, for example, or the fraud investigation um, sector. Eh? Um, there is a legislation on these segments of the private security industry with law of um, 19 of July 1991 on private detectives. But since then, since 30 years, li very little has changed or actually changed in this specific legislation since then. Um, and it is, however, a reality that within modern society, the last 30, the last 20 years, there have been an, an increase in developments. Uh, also, in a, for example, in the fraud investigation sector, it, it has changed and evolved enormously over the past 30 years. And I'm also thinking of GDPR, which is into place now at the European level, um, which has an enormous impact on uh, fraud investigations in countries such as Belgium. Eh? I'm thinking of new technologies regarding big data and analysis, fraud detection systems. Um, and because on the one hand, you're dealing with an old Belgian legislative framework to, um, let, to regulate this segment of the private security industry. On the other hand, you have new European directives. Um, professional organizations which are involved in fraud investigations, to name, that, to name that as an example, are hoping, of course, that legislation will be developed with attention to these new legal requirements and social needs. Um, and this could be legislation which take into, into account the more differences of the, the differences of the businesses in the professional groups in the, in the private security industry. Um, for example, conducting fraud investigations requires different or different um, or specific qualifications. Uh, financial tec technical accounting analysis and so on uh, than those that private detectives or security officers in general must have and the law should take this into account otherwise you can have what i mentioned uh, an, an regulation or seg different segments of the private security industry which evolve at the different phase at the different speed um, and 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 this is important of course because i believe that the strong legal framework not only benefits private providers, eh, but also better security to the clients eh, who, for example, eh, want an, an investigation on, into established irregularities. Eh. Uh, reports of fraud can be better followed and fraudsters can be legally prosecuted. And this will also be a good um, thing, I guess, for the government who has, um, who can see in the fraud investigation sector, eh, this is my example, who can see it as a partner to, um, to tackle fraud. Um, but I think there is more room for a better legislation on different segments of the private security industry. And this is something that should be achieved in Belgium. I have less experience with other countries, of course. Um, but this is something that is probably also in other countries um, the case or could be the case. But it is in Belgium at this moment. I think it is in other countries. It's certainly come up on, uh, on, on other worlds. OK, let me move on. And uh, let me come to you, Nile, if I might. Uh, um, and a question I was going to ask, actually, when um, when uh, you were speaking, it's for, uh, from uh, Jerome Harmson. Uh, and he's got a question about uh, your point about um, uh, 
getting more involvement via other stakeholders in the business. And uh, uh, um, security specific modules on their training sounds a great idea. In fact, it sounds the perfect solution. But how are we gonna get them interested in this? Um, because you can see why, if you're a chief executive, you need to know about uh, finance and human resources and uh, 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 operations even, because uh, they're seen as central. But if you put something like security on a course, and one, there won't be the lecturers to teach it until you can have a job selling it, or, or are you not? I think there we have to um, first probably um, take the fact that we are security professionals and that there is a leadership that we need to take. If we want to take the responsibility of really professionalizing our uh, profession, then I think everybody needs to help in this matter. And I'm just going to give you an example. I've been in, uh, in a course myself for um, to become a master in health and safety. And at the end of the course, I uh, discussed with the, 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 the teachers panel, actually the fact that security is such a, an important uh, uh, domain that needs to be incorporated also in this course. And I was able to actually get myself a module in the uh, future courses regarding security. So, and, and that is actually my way in to uh, give these uh, students um, that module about the basics about security. Of course, this is my teaching towards other people, but I think if everybody starts like that, there will be more and more people involved. And I see that all the students that come out of this, uh, sorry, out of this domain, uh, out of this module, they, they look at security completely different. And I get still questions. Oh, listen, in my company, this and this and this. So there is still this interaction going on and it means, and security is actually a sexy subject. So let's make it and keep it sexy. And if you look at our financial people, um, who hasn't been involved in a fraud? Um, our, our financial colleagues uh, do know why they are putting so many controls in place. It's because they know that fraud can happen. So why not tackle it and talk to them? HR the same, who hasn't had to actually dismiss a person because something happens? So it's actually all about that. And I think there is a way in, but it's, I know it's not an easy one, but if everybody looks on their end and tries to hang on uh, this way, we can actually infiltrate uh, all these courses. And it, I know it's not um, an approach that is maybe organized by a central uh, station, but maybe that's not what we need at first, at least. And afterwards, maybe we can end up and actually have a, a, a whole uh, new network and, and supporters of uh, the security profession. Okay, uh, uh, interesting point. Um, uh, Peter, can I ask you very briefly, uh, um, as a research, as a scholar, to address uh, Nile's very interesting point, looking at security as a sexy subject. And there's an example, that's a great idea, that would appeal to the world. Um, your thoughts, very briefly, if you wouldn't mind, because I want to get a question in from Philip, to Philip as well, if I might. Peter. Uh, actually, I, I can completely agree with Nile. Um, the question is, of course, how would you make it rather sexy or, or as was mentioned earlier, um, security as being or security officers who need to be respected and recognized. Um, how could you achieve this? And I guess in the latest um, one and a half years has demonstrated, I'm afraid, that although private security officers are respected and are recognized, that there is still a long way to go. Um, if you take a look at how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the private security industry and the role that security officers could play within uh, the pandemic or during the pandemic in policing COVID-19, um, I'm afraid that the industry has been less involved than I originally thought it would be. Um, I can refer, for example, to the YouGov um, survey that was taken in the UK. There aren't any surveys in Belgium, I guess, but um, if you take a look at the UK, there you can also see that the profession itself is, uh, or security officers are seen as professional. Uh, they are recognized, but they aren't seen as the real frontline workers during, even during the pandemic. When I thought, when one of my hypo hypotheses during my research was that 
when the um, COVID-19 emerged early 2020, that the private security industry would see it as an opportunity and that we would see, or that private security officers would, be, would become very much more visible um, which actually, I'm afraid, didn't really happen in Belgium, although they, they played their role and, and the private security industry was seen as critical, um, as a critical service. Security officers was, were seen as, um, as um, critical workers, but still it was more in words, I guess, than in real action, that they okay. were recognized and that they were respected as such. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, an interesting topic, and one we're going to actually revisit slightly more on November the 4th to a future uh, webinar, but thank you for feeding into it. Philippe, I want to ask you a question, uh, and the question is inspired by um, Dirk Pichel. I hope I pronounced that right. But Philippe, I want to ask you this because you, uh, you've worked in uh, the security sector, and it's this issue about engaging stakeholders in the meaning of security, in its value in getting them on message about what it can do for them. And I wonder whether I could ask you to put your professional experience hat on. Uh, um, is the security sector really skilled up to do that? And what's the, if not, what's the barrier? Because it seems such an obvious next step to go. Are you optimistic it can do it, Philippe? Well, I'm uh, slightly optimistic uh, in that sense that I, I truly think that, uh, that of course, we as, we as a sector in a whole can do it, but I think it's really dependent on the individual level, uh, which means the person um, at that moment who has the, um, uh, the mandate to, uh, to engage to the stakeholders uh, and to uh, put the value of security in place, is, it, is this a person uh, with how many experience uh, in the field? Uh, does he have the, 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 the needed background? Did he have the training uh, and so on? So what my experience is throughout the years is that in a security company, it's a flat structure, which is very good uh, because it is clear for everybody who to address. And it's also very good for the social mobility of all our people working uh, at our clients. A security guard, a security officer can come a supervisor, a supervisor can come a coordinator, they come assistant manager, they can go to uh, management. The problem there, I think, is that we are not always uh, taking the time to be sure that this person who are, is uh, going up the social uh, ladder, that he has all the skills in place. In Belgium, and I speak in Belgium, is that we are too focused on all the mandatory trainings that someone has to have before he can uh, do the job. And I think that it has to be uh, the other, uh, uh, other way around, and that is, Focus on the skills which are needed to talk to the clients, to uh, de do defend uh, security, to make security sexy, like Neil says, and then focus on these all these mandatory uh, trainings. It's all about individuals, and lots of individuals now working as a supervisor, they are so super what they do on an operational level. They understand the needs of the of the clients. They know perfectly um, which solutions they have to put in place for instruction and procedures. But at the, other, at the other time, they lack some people management skills. And that's so important. We work with humans, not with robots. They, they, it's it's an, an all of our importance that they get the, 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 the focus which is needed to find also the balance between private and professional level. Because we all know that for uh, being a security officer, you don't have to be highly uh, certificated. So this means that we work with lots of people who have some uh, private issues, uh, which are divorced or, or, or things like that. And we have to um, take, uh, uh, take that into account. And that asks very, very high levels of people management from all our supervisors and people in the hierarchy. So I think, of course, we are capable to do that, but we don't have to, uh, but we have to keep the focus on the welfare and well-being of all our people in that flat structure. And that only, and then we can overcome all these uh, issues, uh, I think. So I'm slightly optimistic. Well, that's encouraging. Uh, Nile, I'm just going to ask you very briefly uh, about the same topic. There's uh, you and Grant's directed a question at you. But uh, um, I guess I've got this same point, isn't it, about one, are you optimistic? And uh, uh, two, um, if you, 
what would you put as headline needs to change for things to be better? Uh, Nele? Um, optimistic, I'm, I'm always optimistic. Otherwise, um, why would you continue, isn't it? Um, I believe that there is a very, very slow increase in the whole matter. What I'm saying is it should go much faster. I don't have the impression that we are really, if I look back 20 years ago, I don't see that many things that changed. Um, maybe I don't have the whole spectrum, but it's, it seems like we are not really progressing in that sense. Or let me put it differently. I would like to see us progress much faster. Um, so in that sense, and I feel that a lot of uh, colleagues um, do feel the same, um, but I th again, it's the perception of the security profession that hasn't really changed. And that's the reason why I was thinking of in indeed making more noise on uh, the side of the stakeholders, because it seems that we can't do it ourselves. And it, it's, it's obvious, it's logical in a way. You can't change something if you have to, if you stay in your own backyard. And I think that's what we need to be doing, go abroad. And we are making these alliances uh, already, um, talking with um, uh, risk management and, and, and other uh, stakeholders, but um, it's, it hasn't been that long. So I think we have to really step up in, in that uh, part and then we will definitely uh, be seeing some change and increase in our, um, in our quality of, of our security profession and, and everything that goes with it. Okay, thank you. We're nearly running out of time. We've got the uh, presentation of the Benelux Aspers coming up straight after this session. Um, but I wanna, one of the great things about being in my position, as opposed to being a panelist, is you can ask ridiculously unfair questions. And so what I'm gonna do is right at the very end, uh, um, just in 30 seconds, no more because we're running out of time if you wouldn't mind, ask each of you this. I get the point about selling the security sector better. On a strategic level, what is the single most important thing that needs to happen, needs to change, that will bring about a better impression of the security sector? So if I to ask each of you, no more than 30 seconds. Uh, Peter, you first, if you wouldn't mind. No, I don't mind. I don't think it's a ridiculous question. Um, from my perspective, I think that uh, it would be good that in the near future that um, both sectors, the academy, academic world and the security industry would um, try to help each other without in instrumentalizing each other, eh, without using each other for a certain purpose. But I guess that uh, given the debate of today, for example, that it could be very useful to have more not only fundamental research on private security, but also research on the practice, practices and, and the everyday operations of, for example, security officers yeah, as, as frontline workers. Um, so I guess it's maybe not a strategic goal from that happens from within the security industry. It's also something that we as scholars need to do, but I guess that it could be a more close cooperation between academia and the security industry also to make it more professional, but also to change some of the rather negative perceptions that, that currently still exist, exist uh, regarding private security. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And totally agree with, as, another, as a fellow researcher, Peter, we need more research. Just by the way, on November the 4th, we have a webinar based on latest research on the frontline security officer, a worldwide survey, November the 4th. Uh, um, um, Philippe, um, next to you, please. Uh, um, single thing you want to change. 30 seconds, if you wouldn't mind, Philippe, we're running out of time. Yes, in short, that is that every debate that we do uh, concerning private security, we have to leave the ideological point of view out of the debate and that we have to be more focused on an evidence-based approach. And I think that is keen to get private security and all the employers uh, more in place and have a good uh, image with the public and public authority. Perfect for me. Also, also down the scholarly route. Thank you very much indeed, Philippe. Neil, hey, finally, final comment to you today. Uh, what would you do with your magic wand? I believe that um, indeed everything is based on uh, respect and that is a very a soft skill uh, that we need all of us to um, 
to actually adhere to and uh, for for our frontline workers but any level in the security profession but also outside and again i mentioned about what the customer needs to do uh, on his side it's equally important than what actually the service provider is doing on his side and i think it can only work um if it's in collaboration so that's my end statement Panel, thank you so much. We didn't even get through all the questions. There were just too many questions for me to incorporate. But can I thank uh, the audience for asking the questions? Can I thank my panel for their insights? Um, really, really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to revisit many of those themes. Very interesting to hear about the Benelux and some of the issues. And uh, in some ways, uh, um, while there's no comfort in uh, anywhere facing issues, it is interesting that even in the more developed um, um, or more sophisticated parts of the security sector, some of these traditional problems uh, still appear and are still to be tackled. So thank you very much indeed. And don't forget a copy of the webinar and the blog I will write about what they said will be on the uh, website tomorrow. Um, OK, just a few more comments from me, if I might. Uh, just to say to you that nominations are open still in the Norway the UK and Ireland, uh, uh, and uh, we, we're opening New Zealand. New Zealand's about to come. So uh, do get ready if you're in New Zealand uh, um, uh, uh, and you're listening to this later, New Zealand OSPA's about to open. Uh, okay, that's that. Thank you very much indeed. We, at this point, say thank you very much indeed to our panel. And we move on to the Outstanding Security Performance Awards the presentation of the Benelux Ospers. Now, uh, uh, I'm delighted actually that uh, uh, we're going to be uh, presenting this. It is, of course, slightly tricky at the moment because we need to do this uh, uh, virtually, whereas um, uh, in the past we would have done it physically. And we hope next year to uh, be presenting these face to face. But of course, we're faced with a reality that uh, um, given COVID, we have to do them virtually. But uh, um, what I do want to do is make sure that uh, uh, we recognise where we are. So a few thoughts from me. For those of you who've just joined us, a very warm welcome to the presentation of the 2021 Benelux Outstanding Security Performance Awards. I'm delighted to be here today, although it's virtual, to recognise the best of the best companies, people, products and initiatives from right across the security sector. And you're one of the interesting things for me is that all over the world, people are waiting to see who has won the Benelux Ospers. And there are people waiting to look up details of the winners on websites and LinkedIn. Um, and throughout the proceedings and afterwards, we'll be sharing all the details with our international followers on social media. Uh, and we encourage you to do the same. Use the hashtags on the screen now, if you will. Just to let you know, the winners' summaries, the judges' comments, will be uploaded to the Ospers Benelux website immediately after this presentation. You can see it on the slide there. Now then, before we reveal the 2021 winners, I'd like to take a few minutes to thank those whose without support would not have been possible. Thanks go to our partners, uh, uh, Vincent Vrikin from Securia Media and AS, AIS Benelux International Chapter, uh, uh, our headline sponsors, Babak, who we're very grateful to, and our category sponsors, uh, Mil Milestone and G4S, and of course our trophy sponsor, Edith Cowan University. We recognise that uh, they play a key role too, and thank you very much indeed for the support. Our many supporting associations are key to the success of the OSPERS, who are instrumental in nominating the judging panel to represent them, and I'm personally grateful to the associations. And not least, to our distinguished panel of judges. They gave up their time to assess the entries. Some of them will be assisting me with announcing the finals and winners today. But of course, uh, these are the people who uh, put themselves forward. They agree to mark to an ethics policy. Uh, they agree to mark uh, in a way that's fair and independent. And uh, they're the principles on uh, which the OSPAs are, ba OSPAs are based. Um, we actually, require all our judges to declare any conflict of interest on every single mark sheet. Uh, they all mark independently. And so they too will be finding out who the winners are with you today. 
So the, sus the suspense will soon be over as we move into the awards presentation. Before we name the finalists and reveal who the winners are, I just want to spend a minute to update you on the Oscars globally. Uh, um, uh, we're going from strength to strength. Uh, um, and if, you're, if your company or you know someone uh, with a product or a, 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 a service or initiative in any of these areas, they are eligible to enter. Uh, and all details can be found on the global OSPERS website, the OSPERS.com. Details on all those schemes. And uh, more are being negotiated, I might add, as we speak. And now the time has come to find out who has been judged the most effectively uh, uh, companies, people, initiatives, uh, um, and therefore seen as outstanding in security and therefore will win an outstanding security performance award. Now then, the first award we are presenting is for Outstanding Security Team. Now this OSPA recognizes outstanding security teams in the private, public or voluntary sectors, that is those who have contributed to an improvement in the overall performance of the organization in a definable way. And over to our industry representative judge, Rene Polthate, to announce the finalists and the winner. René, over to you. Thank you, Martin, for handing over. My virtual greetings to everyone and hope all of you are doing well. For the second year in a row, I'm very delighted to announce the finalists and the winner of the Outstanding Security Team. This year's finalists are Alpha Security Team, the Saint-Pierre University Hospital Security Team and the Security Team of the STIB MIVB the public transport company of the Brussels capital region. Now to reveal the winner. And the winner is... ST IB MIVB security team. Congratulations and cheers. Well, thank you very much indeed, Rene. More, many congratulations to STIB MIVB security team. Uh, um, that is uh, an outstanding performance to win against very, very strong opposition. Don't forget the details will be available on the website afterwards. Um, thank you very much and well done. Let's move on to the next category, which is the outstanding security consultant category. And we're very grateful to Milestone for um, sponsoring this. Let's tell you very briefly a little bit about Milestone. Protecting people, property, and your business takes a good eye for pitfalls, patterns, and possibilities. Milestone Systems delivers video management solutions that make sense of what a camera can see. Across the globe, we secure buildings, companies, and cities, large and small, from parking lots to parliaments, from supermarkets to seaports. The Milestone community provides you with solutions, drawing attention to problem areas and opportunities to strengthen security, improve customer experiences, and reduce costs. With our open platform and technology partners, you get unsurpassed flexibility and freedom of choice in everything, from cameras to IoT sensors, to create a solution tailored to your plans and pain points. Your solution can go far beyond video and far beyond security in ways that make a difference for people, the environment, and your bottom line. Let's take a look at your world together. So thank you very much indeed to Milestone for their support of this. Uh, now this category security consultant recognizes an individual, a team or a company. That is open, but what is crystal clear is they have to demonstrate outstanding performance in any area of security consulting.
Now, to reveal the finalist and winner, I'm going to invite a, a judge and long-standing supporter of the Oscars, Michel de Jong, to tell you who the finalists and winners are. Michel, over to you. Thank you, Martin. I'm delighted to announce the finalists and winner of the Outstanding Security Consultant category. The finalists are Ibrahim Boulut of Alsecon and Sampo 6. Let's reveal the winner. And the winner is Sampo 6. Many congratulations to Alzina and her team. Many congratulations to Signpost 6. Um, uh, these, uh, these awards are difficult to win. Even to be a finalist, you have to reach a threshold uh, judged, judged by the judges to be acceptable to be a finalist. So uh, thank you very much indeed to uh, Michel Dejean for announcing that. And many congratulations to Signpost 6. And now for the award of Outstanding Customer Service Initiative. Now this OSPO recognises the organization or individual that operates an outstanding initiative that generates sustainable benefits for customers. And I'm gonna ask Harm Van Dyke, one of our esteemed judges, to reveal the finalists and the winner. Harm, over to you. Thank you, Martin. And I would also like to thank the organization of this Benelux Outstanding Security Performance Award event. I'm delighted to announce the finalists and winner of the Outstanding Customer Service Initiative. And the finalists are GFRS Aviation Recruitment Initiative, Port Security Center Private Initiative, and Workrate Client Service Specialist Initiative. And now to reveal the winner. And the winner is hier in mijn envelop. En de winnaar is GFRS Aviation Recruitment Initiative. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Harm, and many congratulations to uh, this Aviation Recruitment Initiative. Well done, G4S. Uh, um, another very competitive category, very competitive. Just to be a finalist is some achievement. Um, let's move on now to the outstanding new product category. And this recognizes an outstanding new security product that has been designed and implemented to improve any area of security practice and has been introduced to the Benelux security market in the last 12 months. Now, um, Vincent Reeking is going to, to do the honor of announcing the finalists and winner. Uh, Vincent, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Martin. I consider it as a great honor to announce the winner of the Benelux Outstanding Security Performance Awards in the category Outstanding New Security Product on behalf of our news platform veiliginnews.nl that will spread the news under more than 26,000 security professionals in the Benelux. But first of all, I will announce which of the many entries made it to the three best security products of the moment. The finalists are PV App of Corporate Security Service of the Belgian Railways SNCB which allows Securail agents to draw up a report in accordance with the law and GDPR. The second one is TruckWatch from the Cargo Security Company that makes it possible to track highly valuable transports in real time. The third is Fideo from Ironjohn, which is a very fast artificial intelligence platform for video analytics. Each and every one of these products deserve the award. But unfortunately, there is only one award available. And this goes to... PV App of Corporate Security Service of SNCB. Congratulations 
on winning the Outstanding Security Performance Award in the Outstanding New Security Product category. Many congratulations to uh, PV App and uh, the team there. Really well done. Uh, thank you very much indeed to you, Vincent, for announcing the finalists and winner. You've been a big supporter of the Benelux Ospers. We have just three awards remaining. We're building up to the Lifetime Achievement Award. But before we get there, let's go on to the Outstanding Security Partnership category. We have a short video from our headline sponsor, Bavak. Bavak. In our modern world, threats are limitless and are of both a physical and a digital nature. There has not been a simple solution regarding the safety of high-risk buildings and their critical infrastructure for a long time. The total solution for every safety issue is a combination of the right equipment, knowledge and specialists. A one-stop shop, in other words, a complete security system integrator, is the solution offered here. Bavak Security Group from the Netherlands delivers a total solution in high security globally to numerous government agencies, companies and organisations. It starts by making secure the critical infrastructure. Attacks at, for example, water treatment plants, power plants can have a huge impact on society. With customised security management systems, detection systems and various forms of physical perimeter protection, Approaching threats can be detected at the right moment. Bavak has continued to specialize in physical, electronic and cyber security solutions. The sale, installation and service is carried out by qualified, certified and specialized personnel. Each with their own product expertise and focus, this makes complete project management possible, leading to the best results with project integration. Thus, Bavak offers a manageable total solution for every safety risk. Thank you very much indeed, Bavak. Now let's um, tell you a bit more about this outstanding security partnership. This OSPA recognizes a successful security partnership that delivers outstanding security performance. Effective partnerships are most often the result of good planning around identifiable objectives designed to deliver specific benefits that are typically characterized by good management coordination. Now we've got the CEO of Bavac to tell us a bit more about who the finalist and crucially who the winner is. Uh, Jasper Weijman, uh, um, who's the CEO. Over to you, Jasper. Thank you, Martin. I'm delighted to announce the finalist and winner of the Outstanding Security Partnership category. The finalists are Cutting Crime Impact Project, ProHIC Initiative, TAPA EMEA Network, Workrate and North Sea. Now it's time to reveal the winner. And the winner is TAPA EMEA Network. On behalf of the BAFAC team, congratulations. Back to you, Martin. Well, many congratulations to, uh, to the, this initiative. Um, really, really good partnership. Uh, uh, um, uh, again, one against very, very strong opposition. And thank you very much indeed to Jasper, um, big supporter um, uh, for, supporting, uh, for supporting the awards. Uh, well done. Now we've only got two left and the penultimate one is the a security professional under the age of 40 who has excelled and made an impact and is laying the foundation of an outstanding career in security, the outstanding young security professional. Uh, this is actually seen as quite a big uh, uh, award in many countries because it's the future of the security sector. Uh, and we're inviting another one of our distinguished judges to tell us who's been selected as the finalist, Ivan Demisemaker. Uh, Ivan, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Always nice to be here with you and to contribute to the OSPAS. This year, I have the pleasure of announcing the winners in the uh, category of Outstanding Young Security Professionals. And I'm 
especially happy to do that in that category because young professionals are extremely important uh, to EXA. Uh, from our side, uh, we are also launching some initiatives and I'm sure that you will be hearing more about that in uh, the short run. So, for this year, for the OSPAS uh, Young Security Professionals, we had two nominations. First one, Daniel de Jong from AVAC, and second one, Dylan Shaw from Uber. And the winner of this year is Dylan Shaw from Uber. So, congratulations to you. And I would like to say to those who participated but were not, because of course there can be only one winner, uh, so who did not win, please remain active, contribute, uh, give the best of you, because we are really counting on you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Eva. And you're absolutely right, you know. Uh, um, this is a category where uh, um, uh, the uh, judges considered two finalists to be worthy of particularly of becoming finalists and uh, very, very uh, strongly contended. And it's very important people put themselves forward. Look what's happened to Dylan Shaw. He's been uh, um, won an Outstanding Security Performance Award. Good luck to you, Dylan. And we look forward to following your career with great interest. Now then. Now we come to our final and highly prestigious accolade, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Now I'm going to hand over to G4S sponsors of this award to tell us about it and announce the winner. So uh, over first of all then, well, just let's go to G4S. Tell us, please. Securing your world. Thank you, Martin. We are delighted to sponsor this most prestigious uh, accolade, the Lifetime Achievement Award 2021. This award recognizes a senior member of the security community who has consistently shown outstanding performance over an extended period of time and has had a substantial impact upon defining and driving standards in the industry. So now to reveal the winner of the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award. Piet Vorneveld, CSL. Congratulations, Piet. Many congratulations, Piet, and uh, hopefully we'll speak to Piet in a second. Uh, just to say he's worked in the security industry for over 50 years, starting his career at the age of 20, selling security products and services into the Dutch market. In uh, the years that followed, Piet held a number of roles, primarily in the electronic sector, where he was tasked to set up operations in the Benelux regions. He's received many commendations from both clients and colleagues for his contribution to the industry over an extended period of time. His knowledge, expertise, enthusiasm, and kindness are just some of the qualities that were noted. And I'm hoping with the magic that Hannah can wield behind the scenes, or uh, Sarah and Hannah together. Piet, are you there? Can we invite you to speak? Pierre, can we, uh, uh, are you there? We're hoping to get him, we're hoping to get him on. Is he there? It looks like we won't be able to get Pierre. Oh, well, I'm sorry that we can't. Oh, there you are. Look. There yeah, you sorry. are. Listen, many congratulations. What a, what a, a fantastic achievement. Um, uh, you were um, uh, really identified as uh, uh, an outstanding performance over many, many years, and we're delighted to recognize you. Pete, over to you. Do you want to say a few words? I just want to thank the judges for choosing me. Um, yes, I'm in the industry for quite a while, um, starting on a very low level and capable to grow within the industry. 
and I feel very, I, I very much appreciate the fact that uh, my work has been appreciated. You're very, very, um, well, you, it was a very popular, to, to be honest, what you have to do is all the judges vote. They all mark independently. Uh, um, so um, it's been one of those uh, situations where you have to be, you have to go some to win. So from my point of view, I'm always excited to find out who the judges have voted for. So Pierre, many congratulations. Uh, we, do, uh, we do wish you all the very best and look forward hopefully to celebrating with you um, face to face. Uh, perhaps at a later date, but many congratulations and uh, we'll be in touch with you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the presentations of the 2021 Benelux Ospers. But let's congratulate all the winners one last time. <laughs>